The worldwide demand for bitrate capacity continues to double every three years. It is now impossible for any metallic transmission lines to keep up with this trend, leaving optical fiber as the only transmission medium suited to the task. Even the use of wireless communications requires fiber optic connectivity to handle the distance and increasing bandwidth requirements. Fiber optics provides high quality signal transmission with bit error rates of 10 to the minus 12. All network planners must now become familiar with the design and implementation of fiber optic links in their network designs. But how does one begin to design a fiber optic network, especially if you are new to the task? Design is always about choices and is usually a balancing act. The designer must choose from a vast array of equipment components and materials to arrive at a design that will accomplish the project goals and yet be affordable in terms of construction and operating costs. One of the most attractive aspects of fiber optics is that while it can be installed to achieve today's goals, it will continue to handle the increasing bandwidth demands of the future with proper system design. In any given system design, there can be hundreds of variable factors to consider. Among these are operating wavelength, output power, rise time, and spectral purity of the light source, system protocol, the number of splices, connectors, fiber type, attenuation, and dispersion. Other optical considerations include bandwidth concerns, type of transmitter and modulation method, switching requirements, receiver sensitivity, bit error rate, and end-to-end -end signal quality, as well as the cost and ability to upgrade the system in the future. The ancient Romans had a proven strategy for dealing with complex problems. Divide and conquer. And this is a strategy that works for fiber optic system design as well. Even the most complex of networks can be broken down into a series of point-to-point -point links which are designed separately and then integrated to form the entire network. The first step is to define the network architecture and topology. The term network architecture focuses on how elements of the fiber optic system communicate, while the term network topology describes the physical layout of the network such as star, ring, or mesh. Most networks are made up of individual point-to-point -point links, which are individually designed and constructed to form the complete network. A notable exception is the point-to-multipoint network, such as the passive optical networks or PON that are used in cable television distribution. In many cases, the choice of network architecture and topology may have already been decided for you by the network application. Other questions to ask are, what are the fundamental parameters of the link? What services must be provided over the link? And most importantly, what data rates must the link support and over what distance for today and in the future? The answers will define the type of fiber to be used along with the operating wavelength and the type of equipment needed. The three critical issues that must always be foremost in the mind of the designer are attenuation, dispersion, and reflection. These issues are often interrelated. For example, fiber attenuation and dispersion depend on operating wavelength as well as the fiber type. Some interrelations may also limit your choices. The need to achieve low fiber loss suggests operation at 1310 or 1550 nanometers, while the need for optical amplification may require operation in specific bands or operating windows. Your application also drives the features that you consider. If your goal is to interconnect several computers or networks in an office building, coupling losses will be more important. However, if you are building a long haul network or spanning an ocean, fiber attenuation, dispersion, optical amplifiers, and reliability will be your main concerns. In many cases, you can satisfy your design goals in more than one way. For example, you could transmit a single 10 gigabit channel or four WDM signals at 2.5 gigabits each. Both choices deliver 10 gigabits, but the final decision must depend on other factors such as cost, flexibility, reliability, and future expansion. The next step is to define the cable route to determine the actual cable distance as well as the number and locations of splices and possibly regenerators. Defining the route also helps in specifying the type of cable or cables to be used. 
Is it aerial, underground, or underwater? Does it need metallic, shielding to ward off rodent attack? Is it to be directly buried, run through ducts, or placed on poles or towers? In premises applications, the location will dictate the type of cable jacket, while the application will define the best fiber to be used. Careful route planning will also give the designer the precise number and location of splices and connectors. In fiber to the home applications, careful route planning will also provide the protocol used, types of structures, the density and location of fiber management products, and termination techniques whose attenuation must be taken into account as the design calculations proceed. Once the network protocol and physical route have been established along with the types of fiber optic cable to be used, the optical transmission equipment can be selected. Suppliers of transmission equipment offer a wide variety of products and also provide the designer with a wealth of information on how to select the correct equipment for the specific application. The manufacturer will also specify the type of optical fiber that the equipment has been optimized for. With the choice of transmission equipment, the designer can then calculate the anticipated performance of the link. For multi-mode systems, it is necessary to calculate the maximum operating bandwidth required, while for high-speed and long-distance single-mode systems, the maximum optical dispersion must be considered. These parameters will dictate the maximum data rate the system will support over the specified transmission distance. The other critical performance calculation is power budgeting, or loss budgeting, where different operating parameters of the link are specified including transmit power, receiver sensitivity, fiber attenuation, and performance expectations of the system. Loss budgeting is similar to ensuring you have enough money to pay your bills. You will need enough light from the transmitter to cover all optical transmission losses while supplying the receiver with enough light to achieve the desired signal quality or bit error rate. The design must also leave an additional margin above the receiver's minimum requirements to allow for system aging, repairs, as well as adds, moves, and changes. When a loss budget has been calculated, the designer can see if the choice of transmitter and receiver are suitable. Because the fiber distance, number of splices, connectors, and splitters along the span usually cannot be reduced, the designer may need to use a more powerful transmitter, more sensitive receiver, or both if the received power is not adequate. For long spans, amplification or repeaters may be needed. The successful integration of the source wavelength, fiber, connections, splices, and splitters is the key element that all system designers must achieve. It may require several attempts to balance these factors to achieve an acceptable loss budget for the application. The next step is to prepare a transmission capacity budget, which is simply an accounting of the total analog bandwidth or digital data rate the network can support. In systems that use wavelength division multiplexing, the total capacity of a fiber is the sum of all optical channels the fiber carries. The single channel capacity depends on how fast all parts of the link respond to changes in optical signal intensity. In practice, transmission speed is mainly affected by properties of the transmitter, receiver, and fiber. When designing a point-to-point -point network, it's important to ensure that there are enough fibers to satisfy today's requirements as well as allow for future expansion. It is also important to ensure these fibers are of the correct type. If in future there are not enough fibers to handle the increased demand, you'll be forced to implement either time division or wavelength division multiplexing. Wavelength division multiplexing, or WDM, packs a number of optical channels onto a fiber with each channel transmitted at a different wavelength. When designing a new fiber optic network, Always consider using fiber-rich cabling to provide excess capacity for future use. In most new designs, it is common practice to provide between 15 and 50% spare fiber capacity. The additional cost of initially placing fiber-rich cable is insignificant compared to the cost of implementing a full DWDM system later. DWDM technology is used most cost-effectively with point-to-point -point networks to offset the lack of fibers. This is especially true of oceanic links because submarine cable is not fiber rich. 
However, in long haul spans, as well as large metropolitan area networks, DWDM is necessary to accommodate the extremely high bandwidth demands of the network. In the following chapters of this program, we'll look in more detail at the steps of the design process.